Good afternoon. My name is Jim van Geel, Public Program Coordinator here at the Rijks Academy. I'm very excited and happy that we can welcome you here today, both online and in person here in the room. Um, already at the fourth event of the Academy series, this time Arts as Social Practice. Um, Academy is a series of artist-led programs organized in collaboration between the Rijks Academy, Jan van Eyck Academy, both in the Netherlands and the Sestimonium Foundation and the Academy of Fine Arts, UniArts Helsinki, both in Finland. The Jan van Eyck Academy and the Rijks Academy alternate monthly in hosting a public dialogue between its artists and residents. With this series of events, we hope to connect online and offline audiences from Helsinki, Amsterdam and Maastricht, as well as from anywhere else in the world. Later on in this program, during the Q&A section, we will be joined live by the Anfanek Academy and the Academy of Fine Arts, UniArts, Finland. Um, but before we start today's program, I would like to give the word to Rex Academy Director, Emily Patrick. Thank you so much, Jim, and uh, welcome everyone, both uh, here in person and uh, online. It's great to, um, well, have a, an event that can be both uh, physical, bringing people together, which hasn't happened here in a while. Uh, and to be able to extend to our partners um, and audiences uh, outside of the space. Um, so we're really happy to be convening the fourth uh, of this Academy series. This is the second time that we've convened it at the Rex Academy. Um, and we really appreciate the uh, opportunity of this platform, which enabled us to bring together uh, resident artists and alumni and to profile uh, projects that are um, being developed here at the Rights Academy. The subject of the event today is artist social practice, and this um, grows out of the establishment of our social practice workshop, which um, we founded last year at the Rights Academy, and uh, a number of projects that have been uh, in development over the last year in, a, in association with that. Um, Jim uh, will be introducing the event a bit further. Um, so um, I just want to say that uh, we very much um, appreciate the collaboration with the um, Jan van Eyck Academy, with Uni Arts in Helsinki and the Sestimonium Foundation and the creation of an experimental digital platform which uh, enables artists to experiment and share their practices. So I'd like to say thank you, uh, especially to the Sestimonium Foundation for making this possible as well as to their partners for their collaboration and of all our participants. Um, we're really excited about what this space will generate as we go forward and we hope that more artists uh, of our residents and alumni will come forward with uh, exciting ideas that they want to share with us uh, through this platform. So some of the projects that are being discussed today are part of a program um, which the Rights Academy is also collaborating on. Um, called uh, Education from Below, which is a two-year collaboration with partners um, MACVA in Barcelona and Bejave in Zagreb. Um, and that's funded by the European uh, Union Creative Europe Programme. Um, those projects have also been uh, developed in collaboration with Frame Framed in Amsterdam. And Femke Deco has also been working on these projects. So he's here in the, <laughs> in the room as well. Um, so yeah. Just again to thank the Sustainable Foundation and also to extend further thanks to Sticking Jin, which has supported our social practice workshop. And I'll hand back to Jim to introduce the event. Thank you, Emily. Um, yeah, so for now, I'd like to briefly introduce and welcome the participants of today's event who are here with us in Amsterdam and virtually as well. So a warm welcome to two Rex Academy alumni, Bert Scholte and M.A. Sito Lema, as well as current uh, Rex Academy residents, Ratu Er Saraswati. Um, as you know, we are still living through a pandemic, which has meant that we had to make some minor adjustments to today's program. Um, Jan van Eyck alumnus uh, Elisa van Jola could unfortunately not be here with us today. The presentation she was set to give uh, together with Emeisi Dolema about their shared uh, collaborative project Pulp will instead be given by MA uh, alone today. And then Charlene Ravel and uh, Rex Academy alumnus Laura O'Neill of homing could also fortunately not be here with us in person today instead they will be joined uh, they will be joining us i should say um through zoom to give their presentation they will not participate in the panel but they will be here for the q a so if you have questions for them then feel free to post them later on in the q a section 
Um, so again, welcome, Bert, uh, Laura, Charlene, Emma, and Saras. Thank you for joining us. Um, then I would like to welcome my colleague, Elke Attentaus. Um, Elke Attentaus is a visual artist, human rights activist, and mother. From 2005 until 2013, she was part of the artist duo Osterholt Attentaus. In 2013 and 14, she was a resident at the Jan van Eyck Academy. And that same year, Elke became involved with the We Are Here Refugee Collective. Um, together with We Are Here, she set up a school for refugees and several art projects. Currently, she is part of We Sell Reality, a collective consisting of undocumented and documented artists. Uh, the team develops um, uh, products and presentations providing insight into the lives of undocumented refugees. The collective has exhibited at the Amsterdam Museum, Frame and Framed, as well as Kunsthal. In uh, 2021, she joined the Rex Academy as workshop specialist for its newly established workshop social practice. So welcome, Alka. Alka will be moderating the panel conversations and we'll be introducing our speakers later on. Um, and before I give the word to you, um, I also would like to invite our audience to participate in the conversation. Online, you can submit your questions through the live chat and um, for a physical audience here and at the two other locations, they can ask their questions during the Q&A at the end of the conversation. Um, also, I would like to add for everyone that this event is being recorded and will later be made available to view on the Rex Academy website and Vimeo. That's all for now. So, Elke, uh, if you would like to take over, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Elke Uitertuis, as you already um, heard. <laughs> um, before I uh, we start with some um, wonderful examples of social practice. Um, I will give a short introduction on social practice, what it is. Um, I remember that when I started to work as a visual artist and I would go to, for example, a family reunion, my family members would ask me what kind of art I was making. Um, do you paint or do you make sculptures? And when I then in response told them that I used all sorts of me different media, but that I, that all my works involve people, um, if they would not immediately start to talk about another subject, uh, I would get the, uh, the question like, but how that then would be art? Um, but this question I didn't get only uh, during family reunions, uh, my family is totally not enrolled um, in the arts or whatsoever, but I also got this question um, very often in the framework of the art scene, especially when the outcome of the art um, would not necessarily result, be result orientated, uh, but more process orientated. Um, and if the process was not presented within an art space, but within a non-art related context, the question like was always like, is this art? Um, I personally, I tried not to care too much if my practice was recognized as art, as long as it has a social or political impact, um, I was happy. Though I was always wondering how come social practice often is so little recognized as art, even though there are so many artistic decisions being made along the process of making. Um, you start from a certain urgency you want to address, ranging from, ranging from intimate, more personal urgencies to global, I want to change the world urgencies. And then you design a setting, a context in which people can come together to think, to express themselves and create. And the setting needs to be inviting, needs to be understandable, needs to be attractive as people need to feel the urge to join. Instructions need also to be given to a certain extent as most people want to understand what is expected from them. But the instruction should also not be too directive as then people will just walk away or rebel. And then how to present a work that you as an artist may be initiated, but what could not have become without the contributions of the co-creators. Um, how does this translate? And how does this translate to the payment, to the economy of a project? 
So when practicing social practice, you overthink all these kinds of questions and you try to take a position. And this position needs to be constantly re-evaluated along the process as when working with people and when making art, always unexpected things come up. And these re-evaluations do translate to new visualization and insight. So I think this is pretty wonderful. So that's why I'm totally hooked to the social practice. And therefore, I'm also very pleased that I have the honor to set up and run the workshop social practice at the art uh, at the Rijks Academy in close collaboration also with Framer Frames. And that I have the chance to facilitate artists in making their social practices flow. Uh, sometimes I help out practically, I connect artists to certain communities uh, or do some production work. And other times I think along about all these kinds of ethical questions that are also visual questions of them. And I do feel a change. I do feel that slowly social practice is more and more understood as an art form that matters. And, and that more and more artists want to connect to society, to people who do not necessarily find their way to the arts and that want to make change either on a small or a big scale, because I do think that social practice is often quite idealistic driven. Um, I'm very excited, uh, excited to introduce you to all the artists present today, as they are all very interesting social practitioners, um, each, uh, each in their own way, all, in, all idealistic also in their own way. Um, first, I would want to give floor to Holming, who will join us on Zoom. Um, I think you better can introduce your project yourself, so I give you the floor immediately. Welcome, Charlene Rival and Lara O'Neill. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi, yeah. everyone. Yeah, sorry we're at home, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to share the, our, um, yeah. My presentation. So, yeah, so we're home in, and um, yeah, so I'm Lauren, that's Charlene, and um, she's a psychologist, and I'm a visual artist. And uh, we've been collaborating now for two or three years, and uh, we currently have two newborn babies, and uh, yeah, it's um, a little bit uh, awkward, but anyway, um, so yeah, we've been doing a few different projects previously and this is uh, some images of our project at the, where we worked at the Eiffel Museum and with Frame a Frame and it was uh, with um, yeah we started off doing like storytelling workshops so it's a fake news workshop we developed with uh, some children in the summer holidays uh, it was also part of Midsummer Mokum and uh, yeah we from that digital storytelling we kind of got the idea of to work with a different group of uh, people and yeah from that we were also working with ar and we developed some um, face filters and these fil face filters were like digital postcards and yeah we, we kind of wanted to link everything together and we wanted to develop a new project and that was frigatory and it was to um, oops. yeah um you okay yeah, oh but you cannot you can go see it as well go. But yeah, um, but it's your part. Oh, oh this is yeah. it's, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Oh, so oh. anyway, uh, we started with Frigidatory and uh, we started to work with um, the elderly uh, Suriname, Suriname community in particular, uh, sixty-five and over, and uh, it's a generation that was um, yeah. Yeah. So um, that's why we uh, wanted. To to uh, start this uh, project, um, we wanted to do something for the elderly Suriname community uh, because, um, yeah, during the COVID, we had a lot of restrictions. And, um, yeah, the elderly uh, were not uh, capable of uh, visiting, uh, yeah, uh, their relatives uh, overseas. So first uh, we thought, okay, how can we enable them to uh, contact their um, relatives. So we could do that with uh, digital postcards. 
And at the same time, we thought, so we wanted to initially bring people together, especially the elderly Suriname people. And that's how we got into co contact with uh, uh, artists and social practice um, uh, uh, education from below. So first, what we did as first was collecting stories at home at people, because initially we wanted to bring people together uh, in a location, but that wasn't possible. With so the with the COVID restrictions, so we went to these people's houses and we collected uh, their stories, their life stories. And so... Um, and we got different pictures and we also got... Um, objects given to us to share and to scan and to use and this was all um, part of the collecting stories and we digitalized it in um, different formats so we also recorded the stories from the people and uh, this is Bob and he had a really interesting story he was uh, originally born in a town called Ganzi and uh, he had the image Next to it is what happened to uh, his village. Um, so Ganzi is a is a village in the inlands of Suriname during uh, uh, yeah the occupation of the Netherlands, and they wanted to build this dam, and they had to flood uh, the uh, some villages. So he talked about the village, and he talked about that he wasn't able to visit his uh, families. So uh, that was one of the stories we started to collect. And yeah, from eventually uh, we started to make uh, different objects to integrate with more, um, yeah, more stories. Uh, we also made some videos, so it helped to uh, reignite different stories that have been lost as well. And the boat you've seen uh, in the previous image oh, the is Korsha. the Koryal, and the Koryal plays actually a central role in the... Um, in this whole project because it's not only um, a way to uh, connect, uh, eh? it's uh, like in the inlands of Suriname, we use that as a uh, transport um, thing, but um, it is also a symbolize, it also symbolizes traveling from one point to the other and make it uh, possible for you to, um, yeah, to go from the one place to the other. Um, so, so we uh, developed a bronze uh, Coryal. But this, these images right now are from the workshop at uh, Frame of Frame. And this was our first actual workshop with a group of people in person. And it was this summer. And that was because of COVID again. It would took so long to get a group of people in one room. And uh, yeah, we did a mixture of workshop activities in that workshop. <laughs> Uh, we did uh, the digital filters. With, yeah, we did digital filters and we did a AR and uh, we also made, well, this was um, the start of one we worked together with. We were asking them to pick images and objects that represent uh, Suriname. And then we also uh, had new um, participants that came to this workshop. So we also recorded their stories as well. Um, yeah, and still we were collecting stories. So that was really the main thing, uh, collecting stories about uh, people. And um, and also we asked them, what is your, uh, you know, can you mention some uh, lessons in life and what is it what you want to share with um, with the younger generation so this was the first uh, this was the first workshop and as you can see people were busy with clay making uh, models uh, symbolizing uh, yeah objects uh, out of their store uh, life stories but, but also people brought uh, homemade uh, Suriname cakes and Suriname food and we also brought along some like traditional foods and drinks as well. So it was... Uh... Yeah, so this was the first workshop, uh, physical workshop uh, where we came together in frame of frame and the group was quite small uh, still, but uh, uh, yeah, actually during this workshop, uh, the participants really liked it and um, yeah, felt f very free to uh, make uh, whatever they wanted and felt really... Um, yeah, relieved that they could talk with uh, each other and share their stories. And these objects were also part of um, a game later, and we scaled down the ceramics that they made here. Well, we also took them back to the Likes Academy and fired them and gave them back to the participants, but we also uh, scaled down the objects to create 
uh, miniature bronze versions we, we 3d scanned those and um but yeah the participants really got into making um doing the ceramic work but during this workshop we really realized that it wasn't really about us teaching them or us uh, showing them new skills it was more like the, the power of the stories which was more important so it led us to really focus on um delivering the stories now with them instead of a digital um version so it, th that led to the next workshop yeah as, as you can see in the previous image uh you can see that they were really creative uh, uh and making uh, uh yeah very uh, interesting uh, images um and that leads us to the next workshop so this image is uh from the second uh workshop in frame of frame uh you can see that the group is uh, somewhat bigger the stories were uh, now uh, more at um, yeah, the center. Um, as you can see, people really like to share the stories again. So the participants from the first workshop, uh, they continued to come to this one. And uh, people were really, um, yeah, they really wanted to share the stories and their knowledge about uh, Suriname and the Netherlands. And what was really funny was that um, yeah, so this uh, person you see on this image, he, uh, he is a teacher and um, he used to tell all kinds of details about um, the, some Suriname places during the Dutch uh, occupation. And people uh, were really surprised that they didn't know uh, some of these details. So it was really um, a nice uh, transfer of information, sharing knowledge with each other and uh, leave uh, one another behind with uh, some uh, more information. And, uh, and uh, But it was really an active audience as well. Everyone was asking questions and uh, it was really a nice event. <laughs> yeah, everyone was um, really enjoyed it. And we also had uh, food, food as food, well, yeah. um, which uh, we, we organized to so people had a we had a break in between the stories and uh, we had some food and that also during that the food time also generated even more conversation. So it was yeah. really good um, uh, setting. It was really chazelic, shall we say. Yeah. So then uh, actually uh, via uh, frame of frame, they uh, introduced us to Amsterdam Museum. Uh, if we also would like to have a storytelling event in the Amsterdam Museum. So we said, uh, yes, why not? So we had like the third uh, storytelling workshop in the Amsterdam Museum. The audience was somewhat bigger and it was really special because we were in this space, uh, the participatie Saal, as it's called, uh, with the Amsterdam map on the floor. Uh, uh, people sharing their uh, hometown stories next to the Gouden Koets, the golden carriage. And that was really interesting. And what was uh, what also was interesting was that it was a location where people could walk through. So during this um, event, you could see that people uh, who visit uh, the museum uh, uh, originally, uh, came and take a look and they stopped by and they sat for a while and then they yeah if they uh, had enough of it then they walked further but we also and, it was um, really nice because it tied the whole project together for us because we visited these people in the home at, like a year before uh, in southeast and then to bring them out of the home and get the stories into the center of amsterdam was really uh, interesting yeah really nice and what also was nice was that you could see uh the um uh, tourists so it was more of a a combination of um a collection of uh yeah the people from uh, southeast amsterdam coming there sharing their stories their knowledge about Suriname and their own lives and then also tourists who came and sat and listened and uh, could uh, pick up us off, uh, some of the stories. We had a mixture of all the fabrics. So we had some of the maroon fabrics and the Indonesian and uh, we, we created some cushions and, and we just placed it around the room. So it was also a bit more cozy and a bit more, um, yeah, like we took over the space a bit more. And we had two videos running in the room, one of... Uh, Suriname from the 1970s and one of uh, them coming over to Amsterdam from the 1970s. So it was like multi screens and also these created conversations that, uh, yeah, what from from seeing the images that were like they've never seen for years before. Yeah. So 
and we also took the uh, bronze cajal there as well. And uh, yeah, so on this image on the left hand side, you see a piece of the bronze uh, cajal again, and uh, people actually uh, thought that it was an a, artifact of the museum. Of the museum, but it was uh, yeah, we took it actually. Uh, uh, in the in the museum, and uh, it actually traveled uh, along with us, yeah. As these people uh, traveled along and uh, took their stories uh, with them, and we finished off the event with something really special for Amsterdam Museum, and uh, yeah, yeah. This is an image of the of a, a traditional, uh, uh, yeah, indigenous uh, uh, group of people called the Kalinyas. And uh, what was very nice about their part of the story is that they uh, really, um, yeah, they shared some knowledge. A lot of certain people didn't know about uh, them. And uh, yeah, so also they, they give also initially without asking them, they give their part of uh, education uh, from their side to everyone who participated that day. And uh, yeah, it was really impressive and um, really authentic. And that was a very, a very nice ending of this, uh, of this project. Yeah, and it was really nice because he also talked to the audience and uh, answered questions there. And he also asked questions to the audience and told us all to take care of the next generation and the planet. And it was just a really, nice message to leave everyone with that day and it was also a nice way to round up the project and uh, yeah I've and the nice thing is is also that they uh, the people who participated and who uh, actually joined uh, they asked if we would uh, like to continue these uh, events uh, for this year so uh, we said yeah uh, and this is a bit of the video as well, you can see from... Uh... Yes, close this one. Ah, okay. Now you can see it. No. Yeah. So that was uh, Homing's part of the uh, yeah, art as a social practice. <laughs> yeah, that was done. I think it was 10 minutes. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, I think we see you back uh, during the Q&A at the very end of the session. So I'm, I'm curious what kind of questions come up. I think it was a very clear presentation. So thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna now give the floor to Bert Scholte. Um, Bert Scholte is sitting next to me. Um, and he um, uh, did a project uh, uh, under the umbrella of um, Education from below um, in the in the Molenwijk. Um, uh, Molenwijk has a uh, in the Molenwijk. There's a residency uh, from Framer Frames, and um, yeah, tell me, tell us what you did there. <laughs> wow. Okay, yeah. uh, thank you. Um, well, it has been a longer project about uh, the Koekplank or the Speculaas Plank, which is like a woodcut. Uh, kind of a folklore thing from the Netherlands and Belgium, Germany, Europe in different forms. And it's a board to make um, cookies in. So you, it's a woodcut and you push the dough into it and then you hit it and the cookie falls out and then you bake it. Um, and I've been working on it for a longer time and um, first did a, a exhibition in tent and made a music album about it. And I kind of took that music album as a, uh, starting to do several projects. Um, first, uh, there was the uh, also part of the uh, artist social practice uh, project was um, doing these sessions with uh, Rijksacademie residents, um, where I told uh, stories and sang the songs for them one on one in the sound studio. So it was basically kind of like a um, radio session. So two microphones and a table full of the woodcuts. Um, and I was singing these songs, and maybe we can show a bit of the presentation. Um, and so these woodcuts, they are kind of um, historical objects, and they, they have a history in uh, sacrificing. Um, so from the start, they were kind of animals, uh, like a bread shaped like an animal, and that slowly turned into uh, woodcuts shaped like an animal. And um, over time, these uh, cookies, they were used to 
uh, make gifts, basically. And um, the gifts, they could mean various things. So, for example, you could give it big to somebody, to a friend or to a relative. And then the receiver of the gift has to kind of guess what it means. Uh, and this game of often also is, it's often between um, kind of a loving gift and um, kind of a, a mean, it can also be a bit mean, but mean in a friendly way sometimes, I guess. Uh, this is one example of uh, one of the woodcuts. Um, so uh, yeah, these animals, they, they are often there. Um, and there's different uh, things like these, they, these are called the uh, Rijtjesplank, um, which show like various images. Uh, and a lot, like I collect a lot of screenshots from Mark Platz, uh, like, uh, so the, in the middle I have, I bought it from Mark Platz for very, like 10 euros. So they are kind of in between like um, heritage objects and like things that are sold in uh, secondhand stores. Um, and so uh, the radio conversations were often about like, I would bring up the stories around them and uh, kind of see what echoes back from these stories. So for example, I also had a, a conversation with Saras, who is uh, to the left of me, which was also really nice. Um, and I think from what was nice, and I think that's generally what gave me the most from Rijksakademie is that, uh, that you just get uh, back a lot of different things from different views. So basically you, you share your stories and you, you get different things back. And so that was also with this, uh, with this radio project. Um, and I'm still editing these radio sessions. Uh, and the other part of the project was the, was the residency at uh, Frame Framed in the Molenwijk which is uh, in uh, north of Amsterdam. Um, so it's uh, basically a, a high rise area, which looks a lot like a park. So when you're on ground floor, uh, you're basically in a park with a uh, high rise in it. So uh, it's often very, um, uh, very few people on the ground, just two people walking their dogs, but then you feel it's very busy and very lonely at the same time. So it's, it's a very interesting, but beautiful neighborhood. At the, uh, uh so it was yeah it was a nice area to work from uh for me i wanted to bring these cookies into these high-rise flats um by doing workshops and by doing um uh yeah workshop with kids uh, asking them to uh, oh yeah this is uh the cantina by the way this is still from the radio project uh, the Rijksacademy cantina baking the cookies um Let's see how this works. Uh, this, well, this is Bas uh, cooking one of the cookies. I can't, I don't know how it works. Well, okay. Um, yeah, and uh, in the Molenwijk, uh, I also use the songs in the end to do these balcony uh, concerts uh, because the workshops were very nice, but for me, often it's also, which I, noted more often in the social projects is that I kind of there's this struggle always with reaching your crowd and it's kind of a, a fact of fact of life maybe with these projects uh, and which is also the maybe the interesting thing for me about it and in a previous residency in uh, east of Groningen in Pekela um, I, I made a newspaper about the local history and kind of brought it around and there I noticed that my role really was kind of this outsider uh, coming in delivering the stories um, and for this it's kind of like uh, feeling like a, a, a becoming a dorpsgek uh, like the village idiot maybe um, and allowing yourself to to be that in some kind of way where you feel happy for yourself so um, uh, oh yeah, and Bas invented this way of uh, hitting out uh, the dough, by the way. He's wearing ear protection, but he has his own way of <laughs> hitting out the uh, cookie because it sticks to the wood. Uh, the normal way is to, to really uh, 
take the wood and hit, hit it really hard on the table. So a real authentic woodcut you can recognize by the damaged corners. Uh, so there it is. Um, and uh, in the Molewijk, I uh, went to the balconies uh, of people uh, to sing these songs, uh, which, which I also sang in the, in the studio sessions. Uh, and the songs, they are, they take kind of this thing of giving this gift, but also insulting someone at the same time. Uh, they have this kind of quality, which is also in the, in the um, poems around Sinterklaas, uh, which is uh, very much within the family. Um, and it's kind of on the, on the, on the edge of uh, inside of the family and outside of the family. And this, these poems, they kind of reverse the power structure of the family, I think, uh, which is interesting. Um, so also the, the balconies were interesting to me because they are kind of in between the, the public and the private space. Um, and what was very nice about, about doing these balcony concerts uh, is that we found some people who welcomed me and we came with uh, my uh, music uh, amplification and stuff and the camera and we shot these uh, uh, well, these sessions on their balconies, but we were also invited for a, a cup of coffee and tea. And basically the same thing happened, happened as here in Rijks with the various residents, like all these different stories around bread, around the history of cookies. Like everybody has this story. You just have to put it on the table and you'll have a, a story starter, which was very nice. Uh, and I don't know, it was just very, um, for me, I don't know, it was uh, a bit scary. Like, I didn't know what it was uh, when I was doing it. I just went there on the balconies uh, with one person of frame or frame and one person of, uh, there's also some shots in the documentation. Um, and while doing it, I thought that the balcony was a stage for uh, the people on the floor, but actually it was more of a stage for inside. Um, so it was more of a, um, yeah, this was the setting basically. So often it was like a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two uh, situation. Uh, I think most people were three of the family and then me and the other part, people of the crew, like one camera person and one person on frame of frame. Uh, and so in the end, I presented this kind of, um, uh, yeah, this is also one uh balcony uh, and this is me like uh, in one of the last songs where i tried to make a kind of a sarcophage out of these woodcuts um and this is the final presentation where this film is shown in uh molewijk uh, werkplaats molewijk in uh, amsterdam noord uh and i show all the woodcuts which i also kind of i also make my own woodcuts but that's a different story for now um yeah and that's kind of how i uh Put it all together. Uh, I think the project has a lot of like uh, different outcomes uh, and different connections. Uh, and the interesting thing about this social practice for me is also that that there's like one part you can really control, but there's always this part which you can't control at all. Uh, and you're it's it's uncertain in a nice way, and also very frustrating. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm gonna ask you more questions later on about the frustration part. <laughs> but uh, but um, yeah, that will be later on because first we go to um, uh, Saraswati. I'm not used to call you that, like I usually call you Sarah. Um, you're gonna. Um, explain a bit more about the project that you have been developing over the past one and a half year at the Rijks Academy, um, and that is really centered in this neighborhood in Amsterdam Oost. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Can I get the remote, please? Of course. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you for the floor. Um, in this occasion, I would like to share with you my current project, Root of Flowers, that I have been developed, 
it's been since 2020 until now, 2022. Um, firstly, I want to introduce myself. My name is Ratu Saraswati. I come from Jakarta, Indonesia. I'm a Muslim and an artist. The two are interwoven with my sense of selfhood and identity. At the beginning of the residency, I was confronted by a question from someone. The person asked me, how can you be an artist and practice religion? The question has a nature of alienation. And right after that, I started to feel like I don't belong to this place. So um, since that, um, I'm trying to look for this sense of belonging. Um, but it, it was really hard to be in contact with people because yeah, we were in the lockdown. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we were, um, it was during the first, um, first uh, period of lockdown. So I'm, I'm not a photographer, but I start to feel like maybe it's just good to get to know what is out there. And I start to grab my photograph, my, my camera. Then what's striking me the most is the flowers in the neighborhood. Um, they, the people in the neighborhood grow them in a small patch of soil um, surrounding the, their apartment building, their, their house building. It's called the Hevelton. I hope I promise uh, I pronounce it right. So these flowers in the neighborhood are very mm, new to me. They are very beautiful. I've never seen that before. The forms, the smell, the colors. I have never experienced seeing those um, my whole life because I come from a country with a tropical climate. Um, so although I didn't see who plants, who are the planters of these beautiful flowers, but I thought I was like introduced to these invisible hands, the caring and nurturing people. Um, in one of the, yeah, so I keep doing this, uh, taking pictures of flowers and it becomes my routine in the afternoon until, yeah, until one time in autumn, uh, uh, in one of the intuitive walk, um, I, um, I, I, I came to this, uh, monument. Um, so at the time I came to the monument because I wanted to observe this uh, initiative by the um, Amsterdam citizen where they um, uh, laid uh, this um, sea of flowers for the teacher named uh, Samuel Patti who were murdered in France after showing the caricature of the Prophet Muhammad in his classroom. Um, so in my experience, past experience, I used to be a teacher too. I was a teacher and never, I never thought that the profession could be dangerous to anyone up until that time in 2020. So if you're not familiar with with this um, um, monument, this one who I call this creo. Um, the monument symbolizes the freedom of speech. Uh, it was dedicated to the late Theo van Gogh. The film director um, uh, was murdered in 2004. He was murdered after he made his last provocative movie about Islam, which um, many uh, in the community considered as blasphemous. He was murdered in Linneo Strat by, um, by an extremist. When I was there, um, just a few minutes until after I arrived at the place, um, there are more people coming. There were like 20 of them. Uh, at first I didn't know what are this gathering for, but then they start to reveal that um, these people lay some few more flowers and they started to we started to put some posters in the monument. And then I came to realize these posters are showing a lot of uh, hateful message toward Islamic community. And there are many pictures that are very provocative too, but it was not that, that, that was more 
more of them that I thought um, to me is very hard to, to experience myself. One of them, um, one of them um, started to perform a hateful speech and then they, uh, this person tore in Quran pages and spit on it and throw it. Um, yeah. Bear with me, it's not easy to talk about it. And yeah, the cycle of hostility confronted me once again. Um, to be clear, I do not condone any of this violence I mentioned. So after those uh, uh, events that are seemingly serendipitous, I started to think again, uh, what, 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 what is the reason that I have to be there? Why I have to witness all of that? And then I started to think again and looking, looking back on the route that I took on that day, to be precise, what actually brings me there? And I, um, then I set up my studio to be a place for um, the investigation. I invited people to us around um, any background of this place or the historical background to understand what are the symbols in the posters or even just to talk about what are, what are the flowers meant to this society. And then when I take a look again by the map, then I start to realize it was all begin with the flowers in the neighborhood. It was during the springtime that I started to understand what compassion is through these uh, nurturing hands of people who plant the flowers. So I printed the photographs. Um, so I printed the photographs uh, of the flowers that I took the photos uh, during the spring. And then I wrote some uh, message at the back of each paper. It was a um, gratitude message that, um, that I wanted to give back to the neighbors to say how grateful I am to be able to see this beautiful flower because that somehow it makes me feel like I'm welcome in this place. And so, um, yeah, so I, I drop it to people's uh, mailbox and then uh, some people responded. Um, it was very nice to start to have contacts with people who live around me. So this is all of the neighborhood that were very close to the Rex Academy and the, the house that I was, uh, that was assigned for me to live. Um, so it's just around the radius of two or three kilometers around. So then it was very interesting to see and I um, started to hear more about this neighborhood. Um, for example, there's one story about the Angtapot dog, the, 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 the canal, area nearby and um, I, um, I talked to one of the neighbor and uh, she told me about the story when there was a sinkhole in the neighborhood there was a sinkhole um, accidentally um, happened um, in the 2017 and then um, she turned the, the certain sinkhole into a, a garden what an admirable thing to do to to turn a tragedy um, from tragedy to beauty to share with others. As the person said to me, it's about to change the disadvantage into advantage, like what Johan Kruf said. And um, there was also, I received um, Aries rhythms from my neighbors. And this spring, I would like to give it to another neighbor so we can have more Iris in these corners of the neighborhood. One family invited me to sit and enjoy lemon marin pie with them. And so um, I have become a very, very good friend with one of my neighbor. We went to museums and galleries. And following the trace of flowers, one time I went to nursery, um, to the nurseries in the Hilo home. And then where I met a young man who works there, and I invited them to my studio too. And we discussed about many subjects from the floriculture into discrimination in the Netherlands. So there are so many things that um, I come to, um, I come to happen to have this discussion 
because that I come from the started with, with the lens of flowers. So last year in 2021, I came back and visiting again the annual commemoration of Theo Van Ho once more. When I was there, I was by myself. I was with my camera too. I see there, there were less people coming that year. And maybe there is no direct causal links with my project at all. Maybe it was the weather or something else. But however, that has inspired me to write this parable. I will read it to, uh, to all of you. Parable of the Pilgrims. In the first year, a woman encounters 20 pilgrims gathered as they do. They speak no parables, but instead they tear its pages and spit on it. She is paralyzed with shock for 15 seconds, then she flees in fear. In the second year, she sees 10 pilgrims. In the ninth year, she sees one pilgrim. In the 10th year, it is only her. Lastly, this is a picture of a daffodil that grows in my studio right now in this winter. I received it recently from a visitor of my exhibition in open studio last summer. When I look at it, I thought to myself, I may grow too. The bulb has become a plant, it has bloomed. There are always ways to pollinate, to pollinate transformations, to be caring yet also to be critical. So that's what I learned from the flowers in the neighborhood. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, yeah, and then the last but not least, Ame, Ame Sitalema. Uh, you worked, you um, did a project under the umbrella of the education from below together with Alisa van Jolen, but she's unfortunately not here. So you have to do it by yourself. Yes. Um, present Pulp. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. So like Elke just said, um, this is a collaboration, um, a project we've been working on for some years together with Elisa Stefanyol. So I'm speaking here on behalf of the two of us. Um, I would like to have the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> This is work. Okay. And then I get my yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So our project is called Pulp. Um, we initiated this project actually in 2019. Um, and we did the first iteration, and the second iteration was in the context of uh, art and social practice and education from below, which we did here at the Rijks Academy. Um, and Pulp uh, started for us um, as a way of um, actively doing something with questions that we had uh, that were related to uh, modes of consuming, modes of production, um, and particularly in, in relation to the clothing industry worldwide. Um, and also to try to propose or to imagine um, ways of uh, trans, um, I can't find the word, um, transforming material. So thinking of natural uh, resources and uh, material resources and um, thinking of way of using and reusing them. Um, so we initiated this project, um, which started as a workshop. And um, we invited um, children, lots of group of kids, to first gather uh, clothes from themselves or from their relatives and to donate these clothes to us. Um, so these are some examples of the clothes that we were gathering. Um, and with this uh, clothes, we went to um, a mill, very old um, paper mill here in the Netherlands in Lunen. Um, where uh, 
and they have uh, actually they still practice a very old technique of taping of making paper um, um, with rags with cotton uh, rags so we went to the factory and then we talked to them and uh, and asked them uh, if we could bring our own clothes uh, if would it would be possible to recycle them into paper um, so they said yes so that's how the process actually started uh, it's also a very special place because it's run without electricity so it's really like going back to 1600 almost because it's like on steam um, and it's also totally run by volunteers from the area um, so we um, we brought all of the Um, yeah, so here uh, you can see how the factory look, looks like, or the mill. So this is a detail uh, on how the paper is made. So basically it's all cut and put together and you really uh, can still see what the, the fibers are, that it's all these uh, pieces of, uh, of clothes, of material. So what we did with the paper after making it was to uh, organize a workshop here at the Reichs. And our idea was to give this paper back to the group of children. And we uh, invited them to create new, uh, new garments, new pieces of clothes for themselves. Um, there are pictures from the workshop. I think. Yeah. These are images from the workshop um, that happened some months ago. Uh, so during the workshop, we also um, collectively um, uh, talked and thought about um, how to transform these this, this pieces that they had br uh, brought at the beginning. So they were also writing about them and uh, drawing them. And then after that, they were making their own uh, clothes. How the pieces looked. Um, and so the project has two parts. One part is the first and second workshop, which we did with the children and the recycling of the garments and creating the paper and bringing that back to the children and inviting them to think a different way of, uh, of dressing yourself. Um, and then um, we now are working on a second part of the project, which is actually a magazine. And our idea is to create um, a fashion magazine in which you are not having um, only the image of the garments, but actually that the paper uh, itself is the clothes. Um, so we started to, to research into that, how we could print on this paper um, and what was the content that uh, we wanted to have there. Uh, and um, we are collaborating with uh, graphic designer Elizabeth Clement, who is uh, designing the magazine and work with Janneke van der Hagen with a group of kids. And she was uh, photographing um, them wearing the paper clothes. Um, and there are text contributions by Maria Barnas also which actually function uh, in a way um, when we were thinking what kind of text and how text should work uh, within the magazine and also talking with uh, Maria Barnas about it. Um, we um, came up with this idea of also reusing words that were already existing. So actually the starting point for her texts are all um, word collages, text collages that come from old magazines. Uh, and how we are using her text is again as a, we see it as a sort of caption in relation to all the images and this is the way we are including uh, documentation of the workshop which for us was also important that there is 
um, that you can see uh, within the publication how it was produced. Um, so we have a selection of scans, um, the documents, how it was made. And yeah, thank you, Rhonda. Um, yeah, so basically now we are working on this and the biggest challenge at the moment is figuring out how to work with this material because usually you, uh, you can design something and then you, uh, you choose a paper and then you print it. And right now um, we have been going through a process of uh, a lot of disappointments because it's very hard to print on it. So it's actually just trying and uh, also making decisions that are um, very closely related to the possibilities of what the material is actually giving you. So it's in a way a, a, a reverse uh, process. Um, so that's where we are right now. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um... I wonder because like your um, your project is on one hand, it's very socially orientated working with, uh, with the children. Um, at the same time, it's also very material based um, in, in the sense of like uh, working with this clothes, working with this paper, um, which, what does feel more, is, is there one thing that feels more dominant within the process? like? Um, or is it like, a, is it balanced out? Where's the main, where's your main focus? Or do you um, have a main focus? I think it's a, it's a relation between the two because the process of how this paper is made. I mean, if I understand your question, like um, this paper could also be done with just us collecting clothes and making the paper. But for us, the question is also, how is this uh, paper being made? Who, um, who is joining the process? So it's also um, very much about this collective uh, journey that we went with also inviting children to, um, to create something that actually we have no control on, like how the clothes were made. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's their part. Um, so I think to us, it's, it's very much about the two aspects coming together. Um, so it's not that the work is uh, the magazine, because that's a result. The work is actually all the steps that happened in the last years. Yeah. And, and how, how, um, how important it is that the participants get the underlying I don't know, a concept that you have about um, recycling the transformation of the material and sustainability. Mm. I, I have been at, a, at the workshop and, a, and um, I, I'm always wondering about this kind of thing. Like as an artist, you have like big ideas, uh, but when you involve people like they, um, yeah, like uh, how do you deal with this kind of like educational part of the project? Yeah. Do you do you try to teach them this, or is it more at the background? Yeah, I mean, this is. Yeah, I think this is very important for. I, I can imagine also for uh, everyone working in, in this kind of uh, practice. Um, of course, um, I mean, we didn't we didn't do. You were there, so we didn't give like a lecture first or explaining, but. We, the, what we wanted to give is actually the experience of um, really doing something else with that material. So it was very practical, uh, but they were the ones, I mean, the clothes belong to them. So that was also important. It's not just anything, but it was the, something that they had, uh, they brought that and we had transformed that into a new material and they were giving that new material also uh, form and I think the challenge was also trying to um, um, have the kids think in a different way about um, what a piece of garment can actually be um, so that was our um, 
maybe also yeah uh, one of our main interests in trying to open up um, this idea of what it actually should look like or what it should be so I think in these processes there is a lot happening that maybe it's not educational in the in the sense that um, yeah they learn this and that about recycling or about uh, the damage that uh, the clothing industry is bringing into the, the world but it's more uh, it's smaller it has to do with them and how they relate to this material so they saw this process and they created something different with it and I think that was our choice or like uh, to to try to give them that yeah 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 you you mentioned opening up and you mentioned frustration <laughs> <laughs> about opening up um sometimes like uh, it's it's quite hard to involve the people that you want to involve and i thought like interesting in your project also is that you as you describe the tradition uh, it's a family tradition, so it kind of needs maybe also some intimacy and you are being dropped in a neighborhood where you actually don't know somebody. And then you start um, to practice um, an, a, a tradition or to like to, yeah, to find a connection through a tradition that is um, uh, quite intimate in its, um, um, uh, in its essence. Um, and here at the Rijks Academy, it was maybe therefore also more easy because the intimate relationship were already there. Um, how 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 do you? Because I I think it's quite interesting the way you um, um, actually like the the way you connect is quite intimate. As I I hear in your presentation, like singing songs for somebody, it's like a um, a um, a personal concert like uh, I would be so honored to to get one once <laughs> but I kind of feel like it's it's very interesting to to see that the social practice can be also in that sense like small and so intimate um how what is your frustration then actually do you need to reach out to a lot of people when do you feel a project succeeds and in the sense of reaching out mm -hmm. yeah maybe i just al always start thinking big or something but um when you're in a neighborhood you start by thinking oh or there's these big questions what what is this neighborhood or and it's a like i'm not really interested in, in like giving an opinion on a whole neighborhood or a whole village like it's it's not doable for me as an artist and i'm so uh, and it's interesting that you say like it's about the family and because I think if you talk about any tradition or like the most like talked about tradition like Sinter class is like also like a festival now it's like a it's a bit like a lowlands or with a TV registration and um, so for me it's interesting to bring it back to that family scale um, and yeah that's hard because also like obviously i'm not in my own family there i'm this outsider so you're always kind of this outsider coming in um but i think also this role as an outsider is quite yeah it, it can give you like also uh it can give you some some um points of view maybe or ways in um I don't know if that answered, like, what was the question? <laughs> I don't know. It yeah. was a long story. I, I kind of, I, I um, um, how, how was it perceived by the people that, in, that you got in, in their houses mm. to make the, do the, do the songs, for example, the concerts on the balconies? Yeah, I think it, there's like this conversations in, uh, in advance, like where I already start telling a bit about the stories, but mostly, um, yeah, I didn't want to come in like saying like this is my story and here it is. First, I think it yeah it was just logical to just listen also uh, to yeah to get to know each other a bit. So um, yeah, I think that was also very interesting to me. And in that sense, it always also uh, having these conversations in advance or during the songs also in 
beauty of the performances. I also kind of, yeah, the songs are quite like they are, they are not like structured like uh, um, couplet, refrain, uh, first, uh, first chorus, uh, the kind of pop structure, but they're kind of more open ended. So I can kind of improvise over my own. It's just like a backing track and a microphone. Uh, and some songs are really like they have a lot of space for kind of um, adaptation. Yeah, so I it's also more interesting musically for me to keep it a bit open ended in, in at the musical side of things. So there's room for like conversation within the songs also. So that was also quite interesting. So to kind of add this, it's also in the video where you kind of hear these conversations or stories coming back. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the people that are actually where you are, like um, um, where you're doing the concerts, the conversations are immediately translated to the songs, in, in the song somehow. Yeah, in some, yeah. In some situations they were. Yeah. Uh, and in the studio sessions, it was literally also about translation because all the songs are in Dutch. And for me, it was important. And I like translation has always been kind of this uh, thing I can't really do well. So for me, having these conversations and then singing a song in Dutch uh, was a way also for me to translate the context of what's mm. happening or mm. uh, yeah, to, to find a way to, to translate or to find words around the work and not literally yeah. uh, translating the like the kind of sometimes very dull poems that they are um or very like yeah it's it was always a thing i kind of if i started doing it like it didn't work um yeah so that that was like i think these conversations brought a lot of perspectives about like different breads or for instance like saras mentioned like these crocodiles these bread crocodiles from uh, indonesia which were very nice like i didn't know them at all uh so i think yeah there were things added to the work uh, mm -hmm. for me, and that was very nice. Yeah. So, like, so the 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 people that participate, the audiences, like, which is actually both in in one, mm -hmm. um, kind of like adds to the story writing in a in a way, and I think that also links very much to your practice. Um, you your work is very much about storytelling, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the people you approach kind of become part of the, the stories um, that you then again perform. Um, how they are involved? Um, are they aware that they are part of the story? Mm -hmm. Well, because in the story itself, I don't really mention about individual. Uh, I mean, like the stories that I'm writing now in this, in the, form of parable, I do not really clearly mention any characters. As if when I discuss the stories, uh, the anecdotal stories that I experience with my neighbors, um, I just thought like if I want to share the story, it should be, I have to respect their privacy as my relationship with them is also private. And I know that in this society, in the, in the Dutch society, it is important to build that sense of individual. So um, with my stories, um, I do, I, for example, how to connect this spring flower with the autumn flowers. Well, when I wanted to talk about these autumn flowers, of course, it's not like I'm going to talk about it right away with my neighbor that there's these things going on in Ostapark, for example. Well, I have to get to know them well, then to finally talk about these matters. Well, it's not easy because it's it's not easy to build up a, a relationship. I might come close with one or two, but what about the rest? It's it's about like we'll see how it grows. It's literally like growing a plants. I I do I couldn't force it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, the so you you keep like the the people that actually co-writing your story, whether they are aware or not. You. You, you keep them um, anonymous. Um, yes. Yeah, and that is like a, um, a clear decision. How, how do you, uh, MA, like how do you deal with uh, forms of 
representation of people like how, how do you make them like do the children there are are they visible are they or they, do they have a choice to be either visible or not visible meaning visible as in present in the images or in yeah. which way uh, I, yeah i think i i mean it that's practical yes yeah, yeah. Um, well, when we presented the first project in 2019, we actually invited everyone that had participated uh, and they were wearing the clothes uh, at the presentation. Um, and um, now because, yeah, we are busy with the magazine, so it feel, it, it's like a different kind of situation. Um, so, yeah, they're in there, of course, because they're like everywhere. <laughs> they made the clothes, they're in the pictures and uh, their names are there. Um, so, so yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and how is that with you? Like how, how do, do the people that are becoming part of your work become visible, I don't know. Well, yeah, they are visible and I ask them, like, because it's filmed also, I ask their permission if, if I can use it. Um, but for, like, for example, like, like I was invited for these, or like we make kind of a uh, call for if people wanted to host this concert at their home. Um, but the thing I noted was that, that uh, women often respond, like, all of the concerts were, like, we were invited by women. So that's, uh, yeah, that's what I, like, when you don't know who's going to react so it's all often also like um yeah it feels sometimes a bit like a coincidence what happens mm -hmm. yeah. um but it might not but it's all like these connections were already like they were already won from the frame, frame organization so uh it's also about like already having connections and that people feel trusted to invite this stranger at mm -hmm. their balcony so it's Maybe it helps that I'm also a bit like vulnerable in the situation of doing a singing song in someone's home. Which yeah, is yeah, a bit yeah. Of a, yeah, yeah. But the help of the institution in this case helps, and you have a very nice tactic, I think, like to approach people to kind of become part of the project you didn't uh, didn't know at all, um, and and within the framework of your work, it also doesn't make sense to do it from an institutional framework with what you did was like uh, printing the, the flowers the on the poster, yeah. yeah, and then and then um, put them in the mailboxes with a personal um, uh, story. Yeah. Um, you said only like uh, two relationships have been built up through mm -hmm. this method. Yeah um but how deep do the, these relationships then go like what is the response and how do does this involve uh, like further develop this relationship this content i think it's for me um, of course we cannot say what or you know what what how important the relationship could be but i think what most important to me is how then i can exchange stories with them and um they also tell me their stories so I think that's what, what more important is. For example, I used to think that maybe I should lead the walk. Maybe I should lead the walk to the route with my participant. But now when I walk with my neighbor, she lead the, she lead the route and we go to other places. And that's also possible. So it's not only about like what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And that is maybe also a conclusion. I guess we need to conclude right now. Yeah. Yeah. Marks. Um, first off, to start the Q and A, I would like to switch to uh, Marika Orenius, who is a lecturer of art pedagogy at the Uni Arts Helsinki. Um, for her, maybe she has a question to start with or a response. Um, so if we can do that through Zoom, that would be great. Hi, everybody. You hear me? Yes. <laughs> great. So thank you so much 
for these very rich presentations and different social practices. I really enjoy seeing this. Would love to hear much more from all of you. Uh, I find this difficult to make one question. I really would like to give this, this short time to our students or any who, anyone who wants to ask more. But I have to say that I'm really touched about this connection, this personal engagement, which is in each project, of course, the main part, but also what kind of frustration it can bring up in the process when you don't know how it continues. But this is, I think, always present when we are doing our artworks, but probably more in this in this type of works. Uh, I, as somebody said, I think it was Amy that you don't know there's a lot of happening. So it's not always spoken out what is the kind of pedagogical part of it, but I'm, I'm quite sure that this art uh, practice-based uh, pedagogy is actually the best one you can uh, kind of get out from this and it's not always uh, clear when, where it happens. We don't know here at the Academy of Fine Arts when, when our students are learning which teach, you know. <laughs> so I think this is the kind of question mark still that when, when the learning or, or process or pedagogical achievements are made. But, and also I found this very touching, this Ratu's uh, story about the um, two personal things probably happening in, in this personal engagement and, and very, very violent and, and um, I think very harming situations. So that may, m might wipe away all the idea of pedagogy because the realism or reality comes and, and kind of eats up that project in that point. So these are kind of turning points which uh, stayed in my mind. Um, I, I just give the space somebody else to comment or reflect on this. It would be nice to hear more questions if anybody from Helsinki wants to be online at the moment and ask. I'm not sure how you deal with that if it's the voice or just written uh, question, but please. Um, yeah, I would advise everyone to ask their questions in the chat function of Zoom. Uh, we'll be getting to those um, very shortly. So type them out now, then we still have time. Um, first, I would like to also switch to the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht. Uh, there we are joined by Bruno Alves de Almeida, who is curator and art liaison at the Jan van Eyck Academy. Um, maybe he wants to start off with uh, a response or question as well. If we can go to the Jan van Eyck. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone, for the presentations and conversation. Yeah, a lot of food for thoughts. And I'm here joined by the Jan van Eyck participants and some staff members who I invite to ask questions and reach out to the microphone and interject. Um, I'd like to start maybe with a more general question or just to give you an opportunity to elaborate a bit more on something that I'm uh, excited about, which is this relationship between the short-termness of um, being in a residency and also this dislocation for many artists that come to a place for, in the Hikes Academy, two years, in the Jan van Eyck, 11 months, and in many other residencies, even short, and the relation to uh, with the uh, long-termness of social practice or artistic projects that are dealing with these, these uh, communities and these complex questions. Of course, I'm generalizing, but um, I, I, I wonder if uh, anyone has any uh, personal experiences or ideas about this, this correlation. And I was specifically interested in hearing more from uh, maybe Elke uh, about this component that is very interesting at uh, the Hikes Academy as a residency, which is a social practice um, department and also how the how through this component and through the the ever shifting residents uh, is the hikes also trying to connect to the locality and and if you I know it's still very fresh in initiatives but if you could also elaborate a bit more on how you see the this relation between the long termness of that institutional project with the short termness of the um, artists and practices that you host. Shall I first respond to that question, the last question, or sh or you want to respond to the the short term uh, versus long term relationship? 
um, with people and then the short term um, practic practicalities of projects. Um, um, yeah, I find it a hard one to because every project is very different and um, I think it has to do also like with expectations or expectations that you set yourself. Sometimes I notice that I myself set very high expectations of what I should bring or what I should, uh, and it often kind of um, makes me stuck. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, but it's a hard one, which I often uh, think about uh, like last weekend, I was often, uh, talking to a group of podcast makers who would ha were dealing with the exact same uh, issues of like uh, making a podcast about somebody's life and then like uh, should you be uh, invited to their personal parties or not uh, is this a, a border you cross or not uh, and then as an artist you have a bit of a different role as a journalist maybe then but yeah I don't know like I don't have a clear answer I have more more like uh, I try to sense it in the moment and it's yeah, Rijks Academy for me, two years was very long uh, also. Um, but for instance, in the Molenwijk, I was for three months. Um, yeah, and then, it, yeah, it's, I think it's a matter of also kind of feeling how people, uh, what people expect from you and that you keep it realistically what you want to bring and what you want to get. As, but it's like, it's also hard to, define that sometimes mm -hmm. um so i don't have a clear answer yeah <laughs> yeah from i think from the workshop social practice like ideally i of course like artists and and um, um artists are coming in and out like they are at the rex academy for two years um they yeah they often work with um if they practice the social practice, they work with communities or organizations. And if I facilitate them, I, I prefer to keep in touch. Uh, and by that, like uh, building up also a more sustainable network. Um, I think besides like, like one part of the, the social practice is of course like, uh, or the workshop social practices that I, uh, facilitate the artist um, if they come to me with questions um, but also uh, what I also do is like I, I build up this network um, like I, I I start from here and um, in the neighborhoods the direct surroundings and, and hopefully like it will grow and grow um, though the, the the focus is more on quality of of, of um, of relationships than the quantity. But I think that the, the workshop social practice could actually like um, create uh, some kind of sustainability in within this um, fluctuating environment where artists come in and uh, uh, leave after two years. I do hope so, at least. Tara right. I just wanted to add also because he was asking about the difference and that's so specific to two years that you're like inside this institution but i think for me um it, it worked in a very special way because i was doing social practice before and i continued doing it after although my practice is both uh it's like sometimes studio based and uh lonely and sometimes it's social but i think the two years that i was here i was also um it was possible to just um have introspection in a different way and work in the studio in a different way which was also very important to be able to then also go outside and continue a social practice so i i just wanted to say that also these two years of um of uh looking sort of inside um, can add a lot to the way you then also relate to uh, to others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think this is also for all artists, like um, a different, I mean, like I know Sarah's was really like eager to get contact out of like and build up relationship outside the, the walls of the, the Rijks Academy. Yeah, I thought because when 
when I when I when I get into the Rex Academy, I, I don't only think about doing my activity because I'm at the Rex Academy itself, like specifically in this building, because then I know I moved from Jakarta, where I used to live, to this city, Amsterdam. So this becomes a new, I must say, like a new place for me to also to grasp what it is to live in this place, especially the one that I always pass by. Like I went to the supermarket, I went to, to this uh, corner of the neighborhood. So that's, that is how I try to think about to engage outside of the studio. Yeah, you want to know where you are. I think that's also probably different with people that coming from uh, other countries. Are there more questions? Um, yeah, we had one question come in uh, in the chat for uh, Laura and Charlene. So if we could also go to them on Zoom, that would be great. Um, and the question was regarding participation with a group who comes in from the neighborhood. How did you encourage participation and make participants feel ownership in the project by telling their stories rather than an artist coming in to give them an experience? Um, you mentioned that you didn't have lots of participants in the first round, but more in the next round. How did you grow the interest in participation? Um, to begin with, we went to people's houses and then we did for the actual uh, group workshop. We um, publicized it quite well in Southeast. We went to local community centers and uh, you also digitalized the posters for us. And uh, yeah, and they also told one another at the community centers. And you also got a lot of contacts through contacts. So some people would say, oh, I know a guy. And, and also with the, the last group for Amsterdam Museum, we um, with the indigenous group we it was really amazing because it was also from like context to context who, who how we got in touch with them and that's how the stories became more and visible. also the indigenous uh, group the performance group really wanted to come and perform because uh we said to them we really would like to uh, listen to your story uh, uh about uh yeah what's what's your life story and what is it what you want to share with with everyone and I think they really liked it, uh, that it was a um, very open uh, thing uh, where they could show. And um, yeah, funny enough, they really did something that was uh, really suitable for the uh, artists and social pra practice. But, but yeah. for the last one, actually, Amsterdam Museum, we got less people because of the new restrictions of Corona. Everyone needed a QR code and a lot of the elderly the Suriname community didn't have QR codes for that. So we actually lost a few people between the Frame of Frame storytelling workshop and the Amsterdam Museum, but um, they were all uh, really excited to yeah, keep going with it, but yeah. yeah. That's a really interesting question coming in in the chat, which maybe I would like to ask to you, Bert. Um, it is, uh, is it necessary to have a residue in the work process? Uh, it was a question for all panelists, but I would like to ask it to you because I think both uh, cookies as well as music can be a bit ephemeral. Uh, mm. So how do you work with this? Um, yeah, often for me, it's I I don't always plan like the residue or what it will be. Um, but for the concerts, I brought like a, a, a person who made like video documentation. So that's kind of a residue, but like. Um, yeah, the music album is often also like, um, uh, yeah, it contains all these songs, but I also don't know where to put it. So sometimes I just kind of grab some songs and put it into these kind of projects. But um, yeah, I don't know, like, yeah, I think it's important. Yeah, sometimes it's also just a one-on-one -on -one conversation, which is, the work or like a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations. For example, like when I delivered this newspaper in this uh, village in the Northeast uh, of the Netherlands, um, it was much more like that, that I made this newspaper, but the newspaper wasn't really the work. It was more like uh, being there um, and then having a, a line of like many conversations and then that's it. I, that's more important than, than, than the actual like residue, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Thank you. Um, then uh, I would like to ask you, Saras, one more question as well. And then I think we need to close off because, because we're going a bit over time. Um, and uh, the question coming in from the chat is actually a bit similar. It is, uh, do you have a certain objective in mind when engaging with social practices? Mm, I think, um, again, uh, when I, when I'm, when I start my life in the Netherlands, I really need to know that, that I am being um, placed to another context in this, uh, in the Netherlands. I mean, knowing from Indonesia, I know the Netherlands differently. So when I'm here, I wanted to know what is actually the history that's going on here. Um, even to the very micro ones, I mean, the one that was going into someone's life or the ones that is very recent, like a assassination of filmmaker. So yeah, I think the objective for me is then how to be, how to contribute. I mean, this is why I'm here and then how to contribute socially. It's about making relationship, whether it's in a small scale or in the bigger scale during my two years here. Thank you. I first off wanna thank our speakers of today for so generously sharing their projects and views and experiences. Um, I also wanna thank the people both here in the room and at home or wherever else at the Jan van Eyck Uniarts um, for watching today's program. And secondly, I also wanna thank our partners, the Jan van Eyck Uniarts Helsinki and the Sassimonium Foundation, as well as Stichting Doen, the Creative Europe Program and Framer Frames. And lastly, I also want to give a massive thank you to our technicians of today, Jose and Susanna. You've really done amazing work. It hasn't been easy at the, always. Um, and then before uh, we close off, uh, I also want to remind you that this is a series. Uh, this was the fourth event. Um, pretty soon we will have the fifth, which will be organized by the Jan van Eyck Academy, um, which will be happening in March. So do keep an eye out on our uh, social media channels or subscribe to our newsletters, um, all these good things. Thank you.